Thank you, Craig. Um, <clears throat> I kind of divided my, my comments today into three sections. Um, first of all, some basic background. And I, I structured this based on the frequently asked questions that I get rather because it's so much to say and just sort of sort of responding to the things that people most ask me about the process. And then a bit about Juliet May Fraser, who's the subject of my work. Um, that'll come second. And then third, very quickly, I'm gonna go through a few visuals. So I'm not going to use visuals in my comments because I think it's a little distracting. Plus if I did it, as Craig knows, it'd probably take three hours of your time to describe what I'm looking at. So um, I also wanna start with the background and I divided this into um, three parts of the Bible, um, Genesis, Job, and Exodus. Now, Craig pointed out to me, of course, that Exodus follows Job, <laughs> but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the Sharon Weiner uh, uh, Old Testament versions. So first of all, Genesis, um, the question I get, uh, the number one question is, why did you do this? You know, why at age 75 or however old, however I was, 72, um, why after you've retired and um, You've, you know, you've done everything you're going to do. Why don't you, well, I played golf for a year and I was terrible at it. So that was the real impetus. And then one day I was thinking about, well, I really love school and I've always loved being in school and I love being in class and I love everything about it. So I said, well, maybe I'll audit classes. And within 30 seconds of thinking about auditing classes, getting a second uh, master's degree, I said, well, I'll just get a PhD. So I met with Juliet Maeda, um, an administrator at the university, who was wonderful with me. And we talked about what would make the most sense in terms of my background. I was an English major as an undergraduate. Um, I've always been a great reader and great interest, especially in biography. So she directed me to Laura Lyons, who at the time was the head of the English department. And we had a great conversation. And, and she said, and before I met with her, there was a man who was running, leaping out of her office. And she said, you know, the person you should really work with is a guy who just left my office. She said, Craig House, he gets along with everyone. She said, <laughs> and so that's how I got connected with Craig. It's been it's been most the greatest gift. Um, so this for me was it was not a hobby or an amusement. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had a great tur great interest in con contributing to to knowledge. That was a big driver. And also, I wanted to add, I thought about this this morning. I've always looked at education as a privilege. A lot of people think of it as a right. I think of it as a privilege and always have. Um, and so it's been a privilege to work with Craig, to work with everybody at the university. So I thank them all. Um, <clears throat> how I got here. In order to be accepted in the program, you had to write a paper. So the paper I wrote were under Craig's uh, tutelage was about Julia Morgan and Willa Cather. Julia Morgan was a famous architect of including the YWCA here. And, um, and Willa Cather, kind of comparing and contrasting them. And women's issues have always been a for, at the forefront for me. And as I was working on the Julia Morgan work, um, I, I realized that her mentor was a woman named Phoebe Epperson Hurst. William Epperson Hurst, William uh, Randolph Hurst's mother, and also the wife of George Hurst, who was a senator. And I thought she would be a great subject. For, and so I go to the Library of Congress and I, I, I didn't know how to use the computers and stuff to, to access information. And I said to the man at the desk after I got my card, um, I'm, I'm trying to get information on a Phoebe Apperson Hearst. I'm going to write her biography. And I know George Hearst was a senator. I think maybe the Library of Congress has some data for me. And he looks up from the computer with his big smile on his face and goes like this with his arms. And says, I have great news for you. In May, this was August, in May, a woman just wrote a 666 page biography of Phoebe Epperson Hurst. <laughs> so I remember this, it was a hot August day. <laughs> and I walked out of the Library of Congress and I, and I think I texted you or called you. I, I called Craig right away and said, what do I do now? <laughs> and I had done a lot of research and a lot of things that I got. And he said, don't worry, I have another idea. We'll talk when you get back. And it turned out that um, Bron Solium, who was the curator of, in the Charlotte collection, um, had, knew about the archival information available on Juliet May Fraser. And she has suggested along with other people to Craig that she would be a good biographical subject. And Craig said to me, we sat there, I said, what do you think? I thought about it for five minutes because my mother had been an avocational artist and I grew up with art books and I knew something about that. Um, and also it was a woman and it was in Hawaii. And more importantly, the archival information had never been touched. Um, it was sitting in an archive and had never, ever, so this was a, just a great exploration for me. Um, and I, 
and also the idea that this was a woman born and raised in Hawaii, and also from my initial work, uh, very committed to authenticity and very committed to Hawaiiana at a time when people weren't. Um, the only sources she had were Bishop Museum and, and the, Art, the Honolulu Academy of Arts, which is now the Art Museum. Those are the only two libraries that she really had access to. The State Library was okay, but it was always Bishop Museum. That was a go-to place. Um, and so let me now um, talk about being Job <laughs> and all the kind of challenges that, that I faced, which were all wonderful. I mean, there was no challenge that, that, that was too formidable. Um, digging in the archives, and I want you. To, I want to introduce <laughs> Malia Van Hooklum, who is the archivist from the Jean Charlot collection, in which sits May Fraser's papers, along with David Asherman's papers. But these two people, Craig and Malia, without them, this would this this dissertation would never have been completed. And Malia was at my right hand every minute, not only helping me figure out where things were in the archives, but patient with me. And during COVID. I just had to pick call, call her on the phone to get an answer to it. It's in box three. Can you go to box three? She would bring up box three and find the answers to my question. So um, learning what an archivist can do and be uh, was really an important part of my process. And along with Ellen Chapman, who was her number two person um, through all this. And then um, also work with Kapena Shim in the Hawaiian collection. And he, again, was always resourceful and helpful to me. I'm getting answers to questions. So my appreciation for archivists and librarians has only grown in this process. And then I need to find I needed to find people. Um, a, let me just say a word about the diaries. There were um, diaries from 1935 to 1950, and then the 50s, her most productive decade, were missing, and then picked up again in 60 or 61, and went until her death in 1982. So um, and they were varied. Sometimes were very rich and very plentiful uh, entries, and sometimes there weren't. And there were also travel diaries. She went around the world five times, four times on her own, um, and kept detailed travel diaries. So there was a huge amount of material to, to read through. Um, and then I needed to, um, to, I think 10 months, I think it took me to, to look at the diaries. And I could only do about four, you'll see, I have a picture of what they were like. They're, they're only this big and all handwritten in pencil. So I had to kind of decipher. If, any, if you want to find an expert on reading, Juliet May Fraser's handwriting. Um, so I needed to find people who knew her. And the first person was a woman named, I thought, Kathy Stubler, who had signed her death certificate and seems to have been with May in her last days. Uh, I won't go into everything about um, now I, about her, but my first, my first experience was Malia found her email address. So I emailed her as Dear Kathy, and I introduced myself. And I got back an email that said, I bet you don't like to be called Sherry. I don't like to be called Kathy, period. So now I had to work on making this relationship work, which I did, you know, I apologize. And, and we got to be very close friends. I visited her at her home in Grand Junction, Colorado. Um, she has a May Fraser room that's probably 200 or 300 square feet full of memorabilia of May and her artwork and also her catalog resume, which, which is an artist's compendium and file cards of every piece of work they did and her comments on them. She did them late in life, uh, about 1972 or 73, but Catherine graciously has donated them to the collection and they've been a huge um, addition to the collection. Um, and then Vicki Newble, I think some of you know Victoria Nalani Newble, who's a very famous playwright and writer. She was a hospice nurse with Mae Fraser in her last days, along with Catherine Stubler, and um, was a terrific resource. She, we had a wonderful breakfast and lunches just talking about her experiences, and she knew May. There's so few people living who knew May, and, and Vicki was one of them. And along with Catherine and everybody else, no one had a bad word to say about this woman. I get chicken skin, but everybody loved her. She was a lovely, um, uh, lovely person. Um, and then there were the um, there are three people. Uh, well, there was one living relative, um, a niece, who's a 90 year old sculptor in Sacramento, whose memories of her of, of her auntie were not particularly glowing in the way that I mean, everybody had positive things to say about her. But she she was very protective of her studio. Um, uh, this woman and her sister were um, were boarders at Punahou. And so they spent had did breakfasts and lunches, whatever, with with May, but um, didn't didn't come to her. So that one didn't work out so well. But David Forbes, 
Nancy Morris and John Charlot were my three great resources. Um, David Forbes, who passed away just a few months ago, um, had uh, he has a photographic memory and he could remember everything. And I'd ask a question like, how did May Fraser become a Christian scientist? And he knew the answer to that. Um, he, he's a, a historian of, 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 of great repute. Nancy Morris had gone to, um, had done some work on May's life, um, a particular the project that she did in, in Greece, which I'll talk about. Um, but Nancy Morris al also became my wonderful mentor, pushing me all, when are you gonna get done with this? When, is you, when are you gonna finish? How, how are you progressing? What are you doing? And she also had been um, an archivist at the university as well. Probably, probably not her title, but pretty close. So she had a very strong personal and she also passed away. Um, about about five or six months ago, and she, you know, I, she's the person I wish had been around when I graduated because she was really wanted me to. And then John Charlo, I talked to. I could only speak to him on the phone. I talked to him once. Now this is Jean Charlo, the artist's son, um, and then he gave he, he among other things a warm, wonderful person who knew May Fraser from the time he was a little boy and remembered her little gracious uh, things that she did in the family and how she was always over for dinner. So I got a lot of personal advice from him. And Craig said to me after my umpteenth draft, mm -hmm. call John Charlot again and see what else you can get from him in conversation. So I had another wonderful long conversation with him. So these are three people we've lost within the last six months who were integral to my work. Um, another person who was very important is a, is a man named Mata Umu Alisa. He's a Samoan artist who worked with May and lived with May um, in her later years and his, and his wife, um, Anne. And they were just wonderful helps to me. Um, when I first met Matt and Anne, they live in Laie. He's on the faculty at BYU. He's also a muralist. And May Fraser, of course, was a muralist. Um, and um, he, he sat there and looked at me with this big smile, lovely man. And his wife did most of the talking. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get more out of him. And then it turned out he was hard of hearing. So one of the things we that I helped them with was getting him to Costco to get hearing aids. <laughs> so this whole thing kind of you know becomes this about relationships and the depth of relationships. Um, and then um, the Art Students League. Stephanie Cassidy is uh, May attended the Art Students League in New York, and Stephanie Cassidy was the archivist. And during COVID, I'm emailing her. What records do you have? And she she um, ghosted me practically and kind of went, you know, I don't know, go away. Um, so I was in New York and happened to be walking on 57th Street and remembered that that's where the Art Students League was. Not came, walk, went up to the window. I, I'd like to talk to the archivist. She dropped everything and met with me for an hour. And I got all the information about the classes that May took at the Art Students League, where she lived in New York in 1911, um, et cetera. Um, and then I, there were a bunch of other people. Brown was one of the other people I interviewed. And the, the list is, you know, probably 35 people. Okay, so that's how I found the people who knew her. Then there's the digging. Um, Craig said to me when 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 he was advocating that I do um, Juliet May Fraser's life life story, you'll like this, Sharon. You'll get to go to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows I like to travel, and so did May. Oh, and May didn't like dogs and neither do I. So we have that in common. Um, but she did a fresco uh, 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 in the chapel in, in 1972 on the island of Hios in Greece. And um, I wanted to get, I was gonna get there. I wanted to see the chapel. I'll tell you a lot more about it in a minute. But um, so I needed to figure it out. So Malia said, well, there's a video. Well, the video was pretty scant and it's in Greek with, English subtitles about this about this chapel, but we found out thanks to Malia and our we found out an email address for this woman who was the producer. So I go to Greece. I go to Athens to meet with her. This is very her English is kind of faltering, but we okay. I, I was my friend Becky Ward. We went to Athens together, and we go to lunch. I was just meeting this woman for lunch. I couldn't even find the restaurant I did. And at the top of the stairs of this restaurant, there's this woman with her arms outstretched like this for me. <laughs> And that's what my experience was like in Greece. Everybody was fabulous and warm and welcoming and helpful. Um, and then I just did a return. I went the first time and I got back in March 6, 2020. So I just finished all my research at the archives and I finished going to Greece just when COVID hit. Um, and then I re just returned last May to see my friends in Hios. 
Um, and I also went to Mexico because as I'll tell you about May in a minute, um, she did a mural in Mexico. She made the tiles, the ceramic tiles, Benjamin Parker School mural. It's an, uh, outside of the Benjamin Parker, highly recommended, go see it please. Um, but um, she did produce 2000, she, and when she was 85 years old with Matt Elisa's help and others in uh, Puebla, Mexico. So I went down there to try to see where she lived and where the studio was and how this Talavera tile is made. I found out how it's made, but none of the buildings that she lived in were extant. And then she had some restaurants she liked to go to in her diary, couldn't find those either. But it was so much fun to try to, to mine for these things. So Exodus, um, April, 2022 was, was a really challenging month. That was the month that I had to finish my dissertation. Um, editing captions, working with Craig probably every five minutes. Um, how do I do this? How do I do that? And uh, Zoe Spratt, who was just a fabulous assistant, um, helped me with all that. And then revisiting my friends in in um, in Hios in May, and then graduation and the biography prize. I bring all this up as part of Exodus because there's this huge letdown, uh, which I wasn't ready for. I was really like. Uh, and I had a graduation party and there was a cake that said, what next? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it still feels. It feels like, I, I feel like I should be more productive and I can address myself to some of those issues in a minute, but um, but the sense of letdown was, was really interesting for me. And then I wanna um, finish this part by talking about what I learned um, along the way. Um, technology, now remember, I, I hadn't been in school in 30 years and the technology was very different and fantastic. Um, Craig, the first time we, we met with Malia, Craig and Malia took me down to the microfilm area. And I'm going, <laughs> oh my God, no, no, I really, <laughs> really no. I don't have good eyesight to begin with. Um, so then I discovered newspapers.com, the greatest, the greatest app in the world. Um, and it was just fantastic. And then um, also been verified, which is how I found a lot of people, uh, how I found her niece, how I found Catherine Stuber, how I found a lot of people. So those two things. Um, and then um, having Malia, who was a person who could answer almost every question that I could possibly ask. Um, and the support of the English department, especially, of course, Craig, um, the champion of all of this. And Christina Bacalega, Bacalega, Bacalega. Um, who was who actually had to push me to get my second language requirement done, which I did. Um, and then the, um, the, the, it was very interesting for me to be in class because here I am a person who hadn't been in class for 35 years or something and being with people from different generations and different points of view. And it's commonly among my friends, people say, oh, this generation, they don't work hard enough. They, you know, they're all goofing off. And my experience with my peers and my classes I can say with absolute sincerity and directness that these are, this is a wonderful generation of people and, and good students and the, this university is, is, is a fine and wonderful institution. Um, and then the, the thrill of discovery was another thing that I learned. The thrill of opening up a diary that had never been opened before. And Malia will attest to my little Eurekas every now and then. <laughs> you know, Listen to this, she wrote this. Um, it's just an amazing experience to look at primary research that's never been never been touched before. And then um, applying my skills in my PR career, uh, the relationship skills, which really came in came in to help. You know, I'm not going to take no, take no for an answer, and I'm going to have to do it gracefully. Um, and so that really helped me a lot. Um, and the support of my friends. Um, my best friend is a psychologist, Dr. Linda Fox, who's a child and family service, and she's been my best friend for almost 50 years. And she kept saying to me, because she got her doctorate, just remember that the faculty wants you to succeed. And that was a big difference in my life because in corporate, the corporate world, you're not so sure people want you to succeed. <laughs> but um, I had that feeling all the way along. As soon as she said that, it changed everything. Yeah, they're with me. They want me to be successful. They want me to get this degree. And then finally, um, I was so lucky to have the time and the, I could get to the time and the resources to do this. I had all the time in the world and all the resources in the world, especially to travel. Um, and that was just a gift that I'm so lucky that I did this. And it was just, this is the best adventure of my life. I'm so glad I did this. Um, so now I want to tell you a little bit about Juliet May Fraser. And then I'm gonna show you some pretty pictures. Um, 
her life in a nutshell. She was born in 1887 in the kingdom of Hawaii. Her parents came from California, her father to make a living of some sort. He missed the gold rush in California, came from Illinois. And her mother was a stay-at-home mom until her father was a drunkard and left the family. And her mother went to work as a teacher at Kaiulani School in Kalihi um, and became, I think, the first woman uh, principal of a school in Hawaii. Um, and uh, when she retired in 1935, uh, she was, there was a front page story in the, in the paper about her mother. That's what a, what a, a terrific teacher and school administrator she was. Um, she went to Wellesley and graduated in 1909, the second person from woman from Hawaii to go there. Her mother wanted her to go and get the best possible education. And she hated it mm -hmm. um, because at Wellesley, there was no applied arts. And I think her mother probably wanted her to be a, a you know, nice girl, get married, have kids, settle down um, and marry well. I think that's probably why she went to Wellesley besides getting a good education. Well, I'm she, gonna put a footnote in here just really quickly, yeah. which is she went to Wellesley from Punahou. Right, so right. For a while, I, I forgot about Punahou. Sorry, I forgot about Punahou. Right there, graduated <laughs> Punahou. She was the, um, you'll see the picture of it, but she was the valedictorian of her class of 19 people at Punahou. And even in the remarks made about her, they called her the great Greek scholar. Um, and so I make, make, make a little aside here about her scholarship. When she was growing up in her very earliest memories, and she did a lot of, um, a lot of uh, compendium of her notes about her earliest memories. Um, the only books in the house were ancient Greek myths, um, uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey. Um, and so this also tweaked in her an interest in Hawaiian myth that was very uh, early in her life. So she took the Greek myths, and then she also got in, in, interested in the gods and the Hawaiian gods and Hawaiian mythology. Um, so she graduates from Wellesley with none of this. She, no art. Um, she had to take Greek and Latin, and she didn't like it very well, very much. Then she got herself to the Art Students League. So she comes back to Hawaii from New York. I mean, from, from Wellesley, which is in Massachusetts. She comes back and worked part time as a teacher and uh, in an art shop to make money to go to the Art Students League in New York. Now this is 1911. She's a single young woman, very re relatively naive, based on everything. And she spent two years and then one summer at the Lance Carlson Landscape School in Woodstock, New York, because she couldn't come back to Hawaii. And she raised all this money, paid for it all herself. She comes back to Hawaii. And she um, got some commissions from rich socialites because her mother was connected pretty well with some of these people, the Dillinghams, the Damons. Um, she did early work for them. She worked at Gump's. Um, and all, almost all of her work was Hawaii themed. Even the work she did when she was at Gump's, she painted screens with, with, and she did all this research on the flowers that she was painting, Hawaiian, Hawaiian floor to make sure it was completely accurate. Um, and then in the 1930s, she got involved with the WPA project to paint the inside of the Edna Allen reading room, the children's room at the Hawaii State Library. And that was her first big mural project. So she did murals and she did them in very diluted oil onto the concrete wall, the cement wall surface. And so they're there and quite faded and, and beautiful even to see them to this day. So it's, again, it's Hawaiian myths. That's what she chose was Hawaiian mythology. And that was in 1934. And then in 1938, she got a, she was now pretty well known thanks to the WPA work, Workers' Progress Administration in the war, Second World War, I mean, between the, in, during the depression. Um, she, she created, um, there was a competition. She was one of four people in the competition in the Chamber of Commerce to do a mural for the Hawaii building in the exhibition of the Golden Gate Exposition on Treasure Island in San Francisco. And it's thir it was 13 panels, and she chose as the topic Makahiki Ho'okupu, which is the presentation of gifts to the, to the king and to the royalty. Um, and that's the mural that's here at Hamilton Library. Um, when you walk into the library, you're gonna see a mural, and that mural was created by May Fraser in charcoal, is something called sanguine, which is a sort of reddish charcoal, in 1938. Um, she hadn't learned fresco technique, the 
fresco being in, into white cement yet. So this was this is one of her early murals. So it shows you a very early interest in mural art, which was also triggered by Diego Rivera and the Mexican muralists, um, including uh, Jean Charlot, who she was going to meet later. Um, but her, the interest in mural and and she 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 liked the idea of the mural and being architectural. Um, so she got interested in in, in that. And then um, I'm just these are just highlights of her life. Believe me, there's a lot more. Um, and then in the 1940s, 1941, December 8th, 1941, she gets on the phone to see what she can get involved with a camouflage project um, where they're going to try to camouflage tanks and planes so the Japanese won't be able to uh, attack them. And she became the director of painting for this camouflage project. So she painted, she directed the coloration of the pieces of burlap that were cut and used into this, into the camouflage. What's important is that the people working in the camouflage project were the former laymakers and the former Hawaiian and, and Filipino um, uh, uh, net, tent, uh, um, uh, net makers, net weavers. And so the net weavers were weaving the netting and the laymakers were cutting and, and, and weaving in these strands that May was supervising the dyeing of. I'm gonna show you a picture and the pictures that, that come up but this is when she really connected with people she would never have or already known. And the diaries were rich with her, uh, with her comments about what people were wearing, the fashion notes about the women that she was working with and everything about what they called the factory. That, it was in Kalihi um, somewhere, it, uh, still yet to be identified. There's a factory street in Kalihi. I think that's probably where it was. Um, and then um, she met Agnes Makaevi. You'll see the picture and the laymakers. And in the 1950s, um, she, uh, in 1952, she produced this book, which is called Kea Nui Nui in Hawaii. For those of you who aren't in Hawaii, um, it's the, uh, means the rainbow. And um, you can see it's a huge cocktail, big folio uh, book. And it's kind of um, uh, before, I'll leave it here for those who are here to take a look at this kind of before and after Hawaii. Uh, it published by the University of Hawaii Press. And in 1952, it was one of the 50 top graphic art books in, in America. Um, and she just did this on her own. There's linotypes and other forms of work. You can help me here. Lithographs and linotypes and, uh, I'm sorry, linoleum types, linoleum linotypes um, uh, that she worked with. And then she also, um, the 1950s were very important. It's just about 1949, I think, that she met uh, Jean Charlot. John Charlotte came here to do a mural for Bachman Hall and for the, for the bank um, in Waikiki. And um, she was here in his diaries and in her diaries. Day two in his diary, went Fraser Bishop Museum. So the first thing she did the second day he was here was take her to Bishop Museum. And I think she probably, he probably met um, Mary Kavena Pukui, which was a good friend of May's and other people on the staff there. But she wanted to make sure that everything he did was authentic and authenticity was really important to her. I've heard a lot of criti some criticisms like on the Makahiki mural, oh, she didn't do this right or that right. It, considering what she had available to her in terms of information, it's a real tour de force. Um, so she was always trying to get these things to be authentic. She also met a young man named David Asherman, who at the time um, was also came here to work with Jean Charlot and learn muralism and learn the what technique, the Juan Fresco technique. They became fast friends. He was 30 years younger than she was, probably about a foot shorter um, and gay. I mean, he proud of it, um, proud of uh, proud of having young men with him and everybody said that about him. So it wasn't anything. So he, he had this life that was different from hers. Um, and yet they were inseparable, especially in her later days, inseparable. Um, they lived together, not, never in the same space, different apartments in Athens and in other places, but it was a, a very interesting relationship. And he was a promoter and a pusher and a fighter, and he would fight for her contracts and he would fight for her budgets and he would fight for everything. And everybody who, especially Matt, um, I mentioned Matt, Matt Umu, uh, Alisa, Matt, Alisa, um, who characterized, he said he, he was the most wonderful addition to her life because he gave her sparkle and he gave her push and he gave her pride in her work. Um, and so the two of them worked beautifully together. Um, the first thing that they did together is in Bilger Hall, just here on the university campus, there are some murals 
um, the first, it was the first one fresco mural she did under the tutelage of Jean Charlot, who volunteered them to do these murals. It's called Air, and, and David Asherman did one as well. So please take a look at it. Um, so once she met, once she met Charlot, and the, the important thing, and I heard this from John and in a minute, once she, um, once she met Char uh, Charlotte, she could drive. She loved to drive, and Charlotte did not drive. So it was all these drives together where they really got to know each other. And of course, she was a sponge for artistic technique information. Um, anyway, and then um, she uh, did the Ipapandi Chapel in Greece as a I won't go through the whole long story, but she did it. They did it. She and David Asherman visited Greece, stumbled on this situation, an empty uh, 40 foot by 10 foot chapel. They painted, May Fraser designed and painted the entire inside of this chapel. And they did it as a gift of aloha from the people of Hawaii to the people of Greece. And the only thing that they paid for, that the people of Greece paid for was the paint. Everything else uh, May Fraser did. And she started it in April of 1962 and it was finished in, um, in in March of 1963, a very long story. Read, read my dissertation and find out more. Um, she um, did a she did the Benjamin Parker uh, Mexican tile work in the 1970s. Also, I should mention in the 1970s she was honored by the Hung Wanji as a living living treasure, and the other person was honored at the same time was Ka'u Pena Wong, who also recently passed away. And he also did one of the five people who, who celebrated her at her fun at May's funeral. So he did a chant at her funeral. Um, and then um, she died of complications of a hip, hip fracture at age 96 in her home, looked after by Catherine Stubler and Vicki Newell. Um, she went around the world five times for those times on her own and kept detailed travel diaries, which I also read. And now let's just take a look at some of these visuals. I just have a dozen of them, so I'm going to go quickly. Now that your interest is peaked. <laughs> well, while she's doing that, let me tell you a little bit about the chapel in Greece. Um, David Asherman was visiting a professor of his uh, from Columbia, who was his Greek professor in Athens, and May was just stopping in Athens on one of her round the world trips. And um, this, these people said, you know, you really should visit some of the islands. And he said, they, they said, we have a cousin, a relative, a relative by marriage who just moved back for her retirement to an island called Pios, which is an Eastern Aegean. You can see Turkey from Pios. And, and so um, they went there just to see an Easter, a Good Friday Easter, Greek Orthodox Easter, which is a very big deal. They went there to see the chapel. And, um, and that's when they decided to offer to paint it. So this is Juliet May Fraser at her Punahou uh, valedictorian uh, outfit in uh, 1904. And you're gonna see, uh, that's her um, in about, about 90, she's about 80, 90, she was about 85 at this point. She loved Palaka. She made most of her own clothes and, <laughs> um, and she, um, she did a lot of Palaka and even David Asherman was seen in a lot of Palaka. She had one outfit that was pants and a top in Palaka, <laughs> but, um, but this, this is the transition to later in life. This is what the diaries look like. And I put my finger on it so you can get a feeling for what, what 
what Malia and I went through. And I was like, can you read this? Can you read that? But I, I really, as I say, I'm the world's expert, expert in her handwriting at this point. Um, this is a section in charcoal of the mural that's down at Hamilton in the lobby. And this is just a detail to show you, this is the Konane um, players. This is a Hawaiian game. And this is always was a, always a very popular section of this mural. And because it was, you see it again in the mural at the Benjamin Parker School, which he did in 1972. Um, and if you can see back in here, there, there are about 20 different Hawaiian sports portrayed um, in this mural. But but she she did, you know, she would take that same concept, that same Hawaiian, and then she would, if, if you can see here, more detail. She learned more about it and put more detail into it. Um, this is May Fraser, the, the, the white face among the brown faces, um, working in the factory on the in the in the um, camouflage project. This woman next to her, Agnes Makaevi, was a woman um, of great stature in her own right. She was a leader in the Mormon Church. She was um, an advocate for the laymakers, a president of the laymakers organization. She'd be like a labor union leader would be now. And she and May got to be very close friends. And I did a lot of digging. Uh, she's worth her own her own life story. Uh, and May called her Aggie. And you can see that all the different fashions that the women wore, but these this was May and her buddies. And then this is in um, in one of the pieces that, that she did. This is this is a Linoleum, 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 uh, of, this is the laymakers at work. There was an exhibit at the Honolulu Academy of Arts called Camouflage Rhythms, which was an, uh, uh, her watercolors, um, plein air watercolors she did, and all kinds of different art of the laymakers. And what she wrote about, and she hoped she hoped to portray in this particular piece of art and others, and you can see the Filipino um, net maker back there, um, what they sang when they worked. And she said, I tried to get the song. I tried to get the idea of them singing as they're working. And she said how beautiful it was. They would sing it and somebody else would come in and sing more. And it was the song uh, that really, uh, that really um, mattered to her. So this is May with um, John Charlot and his wife, Zoma. And they were kind of, according to John Charlot, really family. Uh, they, they, uh, May was always at their house for dinner. And this is a mural that um, is at the uh, American Savings Bank. Uh, uh, and we visited there too. Um, uh, uh, and the Pan Am building uh, that May did. It's wonderful. And this is the, um, this is, this is David Asherman. He, he's probably on a stool because he was about a foot taller than May. But I love this picture. And this was at the dedication of the Benjamin Parker School of Ceramic Mural. So she's 85 at this time, but it's kind of shows the affection that they had for each other. Um, this is uh, me um, in the red uh, at, the, at, the, at the chapel in, um, in Greece. Um, and this man here is the foremost icon painter in all of Greece and did some of the icons at the chapel. Um, this is this woman is one of the only two people who remembered May. Her memory was kind of faulty, but we spent a lot of time together and I won't go through all the other people. This is the young uh, priest, uh, Greek Orthodox priest in charge of the chapel. And then this is inside the chapel. Um, this is they call the people in Greece call this May self portrait. She actually produced she she produced a dress. I don't have a good picture of it. She produced she made herself a dress in the same fabric. It's got Minoan octopuses on it, embroidered. Um, and uh, you can see the lei and you can see the Hawaiian musical instrument that's being played. There are 10 angels in this chapel um, and, um, and they each have a musical instrument based on Psalm 158, 158? 150. 150, uh, based on Psalm 150. And the flowers, there's taro here and there's an almond tree, uh, Hawaii taro almond tree from from Hios here so all the references all the birds all the um all the flora and all the fauna flora were all Hawaiian and <laughs> this this is the Hawaiian warrior angel um this is an angel all the all the angels play musical instruments we have a, a flute here but this is a Hawaiian this is someone blowing a conch shell and she asked the woman who introduced her to the chapel where would you like which angel would you like to be and she said I want to be this one so this is um um, uh, Mrs. Mockery's face 
on the Hawaii, and you can see all the all of the um, the feather work is all different on each one of the angels. Um, there's a little minor bird down here, uh, and that's that's it um, for my presentation. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.